and welcome to Art Fictions. I'm critic and author Elizabeth Fullerton, and my guest this week is the Ukrainian-born Israeli artist Anna Parach. So Anna makes wonderfully evocative fabric sculptures using a technique called tufting that draw on female archetypes from myth, folklore, fairy tale, and popular culture. These are sometimes wearable, made to be inhabited and brought to life by a performer, but even when they are just standalone objects, they have a strong presence that doesn't feel entirely inanimate. Hello, Anna. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. And my absolute pleasure. For our discussion, Anna has chosen the gothic horror novella, The Victorian Chaise Long, by the English writer Marganita Lasky, who was a leading literary figure in London in the 20th century. The book was published in 1953 and opens with the ominous line, Will you give me your word of honour that I'm not going to die? It's set in the late 1940s or early 1950s and is about a young woman invalid, Melanie Langdon, who lies down on a chaise longue and wakes up trapped in the body of another woman, Millie Baines, in the year 1864. The chaise longue, purchased in an antique shop, is the hinge between these two worlds, and terrifyingly, Melanie slash Millie never gets off it for the rest of the book. As the story unfolds through a process of drip feeding of facts, we learn that the two women's lives uncannily mirror each other. Melanie at first assumes it's a bad dream, but as the dream refuses to go away, other possibilities loom. Has she lost her mind? Has she been kidnapped? Is she inhabiting the body of an alter ego from the past? Or has this other woman time traveled forward into her own life, meaning that her modern existence was never real? Melanie decides it must be a kind of test that she must pass to get back to her life and her supposedly real identity and desperately comes up with plans for escape. But every step of the way, her fate is controlled and her plans are thwarted by men. And the clock is ticking as Millie is coughing up blood and there is as yet no cure for TB in the 1860s. In the preface to my copy, the crime writer P.D. James revealed that the author holed herself up in a remote country house to write the book because in order to frighten the reader, she needed to frighten herself. So Anna, I'm curious, what attracted you to the Victorian Chaise Long? So I read about this book initially in the Israeli article and in the newspaper. And the description was of this complex female character that goes through a transformation within the book. And female representation and transformation are quite big themes within my practice. So, um, yeah, I thought it would be a good read for me. Brilliant. Yeah, I was assuming that for you also the focus on two women from two different eras and the roles that they're forced into by social convention might be of interest because you also work a lot around identity and roles that are forced on women too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Both periods are kind of history from our perspective now, but I think the positions they portray of how women are treated by the people around them or how they perceive themselves or you know a lot of this book is about how as you said this feeling of feeling um captured and held and trying to resist something that's external one of the most powerful things maybe for female readers must be this sense of losing your identity entirely yeah i suppose for anyone but especially for women because we've for so long had our voices squashed I think the idea of actually literally merging and the fact that we can't tell, there's no anchorage for us. There's no sense of who's in the reality, which reality is real if one is. I mean, I think for me, there is kind of two things about that. And they're in a way separate, but they're also obviously related to each other and affect each other. There is the female identity and the different aspects of it and how you are perceived externally as an object which is what she almost becomes within the book because she can't move you know she's laying on this just long and she can't really get up she becomes like a furniture herself in a way so there is that aspect to it you know it's interesting how it all kind of happens within a domestic environment and how the woman again plays almost as another 
object within the room. So, you know, people come and go, they move around her, but she's unable to do anything. This is like, she's restricted to this territory. And that's something I very much kind of explore within my work as well, in the sense of quite often the toughest sculptures are performed in. So I recently started thinking more and more about the experience of the performer within the sculpture and, you know, how their movement is restricted, how they're often, it has a mask most often, and they're unable to breathe well. It kind of puts a whole set of requirements. And in some ways, I think that's kind of the domestic space as well. It's a place of safety, but it's also a place that is restrictive. And for the character in the book, it becomes the armchair. So there is that thing that has to do with sort of the kind of female history and the politics and so on. The other aspect of it has to do just the idea of losing one's identity. And I think for me, as somebody who moved from quite a few countries, this is kind of a a common experience and how you, I mean, even, you know, I've been living in the UK for eight years now. And in some situations, it's so odd to me that I'm there. I've been to this uh, event recently and it was very upper class English people. Everybody were really kind and nice. So it's not a critique about the people. But for me, immediately I felt really, not immediately, actually, it took me a while. I felt a bit uncomfortable. And then I started thinking about the city where I grew up and how different my makeup is in some ways. You know, and there is those moments, there is sort of a crisis of identity because I'm this person at this time. And this is my life now. I'm meeting these people and I'm very welcome. But there is also a side of my life who is, that was extremely real as well and still is. But there is no way for me also to convey to them that life. Not because it's so uh, horrible or whatever. Uh, it feels foreign. Yeah, very foreign. So yeah. I think for me there is that aspect within the book as well. I really like that sense of having multiple aspects of identity within you and how they almost fight between them. There is a certain struggle. Yeah. So you actually sometimes feel as though you've been transplanted almost from one either era or place to another. There is a parallel with this situation where she's time traveled. In a way, yeah. I was supposed to be uh, on a holiday now in a different country and I couldn't go because of COVID politics. And anyway, Mm -hmm. there is a side of me which is extremely sort of almost childlike in terms of my relation to planes like it's so amazing that you get in somewhere and I get out and because I know Israel so well where I was supposed to go and I have family there and it's sort of like I'm back to that reality and that reality feels very true to me as well so it's interesting within the book that there is a vehicle as well this just long becomes the vehicle of movement she unfortunately doesn't seem to have a way back she can't book a flight back no. I remember when I first came to Israel, I was seven years old from the Soviet Union, from Ukraine. I remember being so, it's just so amazed by the views and by how everything is so, uh, you know, radically different. But the reason I was saying that is that because, you know, I think for me, it's a very early and very basic experience of having that sort of rupture where you go from, this is who I am, this is what I know, to, okay, this is a whole new thing and I have to figure it out, who I am and what I am. And very similar to how Millie, when she becomes Millie in the beginning, she sort of looks around the flat and she mentions all the objects she sees and she's sort of like a detective. So I'm very familiar with that experience, really carefully analyzing my environment. Yeah. I also think it's interesting that there's not one reality that's more real than the other she talks very strongly about the smell the fetid smell in the room of Millie you know going back into the 19th century so it's not like one is less real than the other she does have bodily physical sensations in this other world she wakes up in so like you're talking about these parallel realities are still going on when you left the Soviet Union life didn't stop there it carried on and you know when you left Israel That reality is still happening when you come to the UK. It's interesting because the Soviet Union doesn't actually exist anymore. So it's even more strange because it's almost, uh, you know, now there is Ukraine, but it's not the same place now anymore. So in a way, it's really weird. And it's not only my own personal story. It's a story of, you know, everybody who come from 
that origin. You belong to a place that no longer exists. Yeah, of course. I find that so odd. And so, you know, it kind of adds another layer. Like, supposedly you're from there, but there is no such place anymore. And for her as well, in terms of the book, you have the description of her real life, supposedly real life. It's quite short. And most of the time we spend with her other identity. It's interesting. If you think about this book as you think about a person, right? Like people speak about a mother tongue. And you might be living somewhere else most of your life, but you still have this mother tongue and where you were born. So in a way for her as well, it's like we start with her at this point of like, although it's quite short and we transport it to the other reality, we start with her at this like, this is real and everything else is kind of a layer on top of it. But it's very unclear. I don't know. Did you kind of have a conclusion? Like what is real for her? Like that's not what you're supposed to do with the book, but still... I honestly couldn't work it out. I mean, I was going to actually ask you what you made of the ending. Spoiler alert. Because I guess that would reflect what your perception was of what was real and what wasn't. But I guess for me, I'm hoping that Millie has to die in order for Melanie to regain her life. That's what she kind of hopes for at some point. I think the beginning is the reality. Because the beginning is quite superficial. We get the doctor's perspective, the physician's perspective, and he's kind of giving us, you know, the more emotional information. It's all through his perception. We see her through his eyes as this kind of really flat, giggly, blonde child, almost woman child. Yes. And then I think really the rest of it is her experience. So Yeah, she's a much deeper character, actually, for us as a reader once she's yeah. done when we previously spoke i spoke to you about the tv show uh, stranger things yeah where they have this like uh, kind of the opposite world which is lurking behind the walls right it's there it's completely the same but it's filled with this like with everything that's inhibited perhaps or unspoken you know what thinking about it now maybe it's a positive book actually because what happens is that she's processing everything she experienced because they described that how even before having the baby she had to like most of her pregnancy she spends in bed and she has a grudge for the fact that she has to stay there and not moving for such a long time says that she's never able to relax the doctor so maybe you know she kind of goes into the slumber she processes all this because she goes to sleep with the promise of when she wakes up we think she'll be well right yeah so maybe she processes it all And then when she wakes up, as you said, to go back, she's kind of able to go into her new life. I don't know, but maybe it's a bit too optimistic. That's definitely an optimistic reading. But we don't know. She might die also as Melanie. Yeah. uh, Because when Millie dies, she has a sort of -of out-of-body experience, doesn't she? And she kind of can see into the other world in the modern time and she sees the same grouping of people around the chaise longue around her I guess body so we don't know are they grouped around there because she's dying too or because she's just waking up maybe it's like the smoking gun then you know if you have like as you said the first sentence in the book is am I gonna die it's like you know that's the lane of the gun yes you will you will die (laughs) yeah I don't know I mean but I think there is undoubtedly something gained some self-awareness or self-realization or something I think by the female character in the course of this book that she is revealed to be more complex more profound than she seems in the first bit in the doctor's eyes you had a short passage that you wanted to read out about how the doctor sees her and how she behaves right Yep. So this is about how the doctor describes Melanie, basically, in the beginning of the book. And it starts by a short conversation between Melanie and her husband, Guy. Mm -hmm. So Melanie says, how clever you are, darling, said Melanie adoringly. You make me feel so silly compared with you. Oh, but I like you, silly, said Guy. And so he does, thought Dr. Gregory, watching them. But Melanie isn't the fool he thinks her, not by a long chop. She's simply the purely feminine creature who makes herself into anything her man wants her to be. Not that I call her clever, rather cunning. His thoughts checked, a little shocked at the word he had chosen. But he continued resolutely. Yes, cunning as a cartload of monkeys, if ever she needed to be. Yeah, doesn't it make you bristle for someone to say, I like you, silly? (laughs) 
you know what I find, and this is like the full honesty of it. I think, of course, there is. There is that initial, like my current self that kind of experiences this is so patronizing. You know, nobody talks to children like that anymore. So there is that side. And I think it makes me feel really angry because that sort of approach still exists. It's very much with us. We don't speak that way anymore because the codes have changed. But, you know, especially powerful men within the art world, yeah, you do encounter that approach that you're the silly thing like she is. And it's unspoken. It's not being said. And that is extremely frustrating, obviously, and upsetting in many ways. The other side of it, though, is I think as somebody who grew up in such a culture, you take those images in. Those perceptions of women are part of me as a woman as well. Because the doctor, he is kind of a father figure as well in some ways. He knows her since she was a child. He takes mm -hmm. care of her on a daily basis. He gives her medicine. He tells her where she can and cannot go. And she seems to genuinely like him. Mm, yeah. But I think there is another element to it, which is... The sort of security that a paternal figure can give you, that feeling of like, oh, actually, it's quite comforting to be a little girl. Mm -hmm. and, you know, like you don't have to take responsibility. You don't have to do anything. You just have daddy to protect you. There is that element there as well for me. So there is the adult self. I feel very enraged by this. Yes. But the little girl within me, as I said, I think it's definitely because I grew up with that sort of approach and it was shown to me as a positive thing, as a protective thing. Yeah, I noted, I don't know why, I just found myself underlining all the times the word pretty came up in the first part and it comes up all the time. And I think that kind of does encapsulate the mood, this very light, fluffy mood at the start where it's all nice and pretty and carefree, supposedly. And she's this slightly spoiled, pampered woman who has no financial worries. And she's looked after by her husband and the doctor. And everyone's doing everything they can to make her comfortable. She is extremely well taken care of. But that's kind of part of her being a child as well. You know, yeah. it, it's like a little kid who is a bit ill and... He he watches TV as much as it can. Totally. Uh, but yeah. I think this sort of awareness that I was mentioning, the whole thing gets much darker, as we've said, once she wakes up in Millie's body. But you do discover that there's a resourcefulness in her that was unexpected almost from the character that you see at the start. Because she's trying all these different ways of escaping and she has quite philosophical thoughts about her situation and the nature of what is real and what isn't. It's interesting how the long speech the doctor gives about her in the beginning, from his perspective, if she's not silly, she's cunning. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but yeah. From how you really nicely put it, she's much more than this blunt fluff. She's a resourceful woman. She's quite intelligent. She really tries to, to do quite a lot within the means she has, but she is very restricted. Yeah. And there's another thing that I think is so interesting where she actually is trying to formulate a plan of escape, which is to tell the clergyman, look, I can see into the future. I already come from the future because I know these inventions, but her tongue is actually physically stopped from forming those words. So I've got a passage here that talks about that. Here it says, wireless, she screamed in her mind. Television, penicillin, gramophone records, vacuum cleaners, but none of these words could be framed by her lips. I can think them. Why can't I say them? She begged. Can I introduce nothing into this real past? And if I cannot, then even these thoughts I am thinking, has Millie thought them before? But things can't happen twice, she told herself wearily, closing her eyes. I must have always been Millie and Millie me. It is now that is present reality and the future is still to come. But if I have to wait for the future, if it is only in time to come that I shall be Melanie again, then that time must come again too when Sister Smith leaves me to sleep on the chaise longue and I wake up in the past. I shall never escape and the eternal prison she imagined consumed her mind and she fainted or dozed off into a nightmare of chase and pursuit and loss. I think that's interesting how 
she literally is almost possessed. I mean, we haven't talked about that, but there's also the implication that this Shazlong could be a supernatural force or something, right? There's something actually stopping her physically from getting off the couch and stopping her saying these words. It's almost like what I told you in the beginning about how you can't really describe certain experiences. It feels so foreign and suddenly you kind of question if those things really exist. When we spoke yesterday, you were saying you had worked in therapy as well. Yeah, I have a diploma in counseling and art therapy, and I worked in mental health for quite a few years. And yeah, so I was exposed to people whose sense of reality wasn't always uh, the same as most of us have. And, you know, in the book, although supposedly all the boundaries of reality fall down for her, but she's still somehow quite, yeah, she's quite resilient, isn't she? She's really trying to make sense of things and like desperately trying to go back to what she understands to be reality. Yeah, and each reality is convincing. So just like someone in psychosis. Yeah, in psychosis, I think you are extremely convinced that that is reality and it doesn't make sense to challenge it because it's a kind of a protective layer because the Mm -hmm. truth is actually much scarier than even the fantasy you create is actually a defensive layer for the psyche and it keeps you not falling apart. Yeah, absolutely. What about sex in the book and ecstasy? Because I feel as though those are themes that come through um, in sort of positive and negative ways. You did mention in the beginning that she's physically ill because I was reading and she has this, there are real, you know, coughings and trembling of the body and... It just made me think about, you know, this is, again, something I'm quite interested with is this kind of state of hysteria, for example, where your body is communicating, really, where you cannot process mentally, or you cannot speak it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how they came up with how psychoanalysis helps, right? You free yourself by speaking about it. And Mm -hmm. then it's, it's outside of the body. And it goes to sex as well. So there is a few mentions of that, right? As Millie, she's blamed for promiscuity, right? And then as Melanie, she mentions how much in love she and Guy were and their passionate sort of relationship. So it's definitely present there. And in fact, sex is really intertwined with the chaise long. Because when she first is in the antique shop, she has this really weird fleeting sensation of having been pressed by another body into the chaise long she can't place it and she doesn't elaborate on that but it comes again when she sees gilbert and he's the double for her husband guy you remember the physician he kind of hints that guy's cheating on melanie he says that because she's ill and she's been pregnant so i think it's almost like maybe guy is cheating as gilbert or something it's interesting because the roles change as well, right? Because Guy is like implied that he's maybe cheating on Melanie and it seems like a normal thing. You know, it's almost like he mentions it as a sign of his good health. With Millie, there is a sense of guilt about this love affair she had. Like her sister, she's very angry with her for that. Yeah, she's very controlling. It's like a reversal, isn't it? It's interesting. Mm. The sister has taken away her baby. It reminded me of the film Misery in a weird way, just having this really controlling force at your bedside determining what you can do. The sister won't let her have her baby unless Millie says who was the father. And of course, Melanie doesn't know who was the father. And then the sister Adelaide slaps her because the assumption is you've had so much sex, you don't know who the father is. But yeah, again, I wonder if maybe that's kind of how Melanie feels as well, because she's sort of punished. And she's unable to see her child. Most commonly, it's quite a cruel thing to be away from your little baby. Yeah, it feels very extreme. It's very extreme. I think the more we speak, basically, what I'm becoming more and more sure of is that the book begins with an external portrayal of Melanie. It's by other people, by men. Mm. And then the other part of the book is really how she experiences the whole thing. And it is a bit of a dream state where things kind of mix up and, you know, like, I think that's her whole emotional experience of that situation. And it's like the external portrayal is of this beautiful house and this blonde, perfect, beautiful, silly woman 
who is taken care of so well by these people. But actually, her internal experience is that maybe she can't rely on her husband as much and she's denied from seeing her child. You know, so it's all the emotional baggage and the fact that she was not allowed to leave the bed for such a long time and still is not. Yeah, definitely. It's that feeling of like being stuck. And actually, I also think that by drawing a thread between those 90 years, she's also making the point that there hasn't been necessarily so much change for the position of women in terms of their agency. There is another element. Her social class changes. Yes. Very deeply. (laughs) Yeah. When she transitions to being Millie, and in both positions, she's more pampered. But yeah, her agency doesn't appear neither there or there. Yeah, exactly. I feel as though this is a neat segue into your practice because your practice is so much centered around female agency and roles and performance of those roles. I was thinking there are so many parallels with your practice. You mentioned already to some extent the domestic and your work in tufting, which is a process for making carpet textiles by hand tied to the traditionally feminine domestic realm, but also the idea of being trapped or trapped in a role. You've made several works around the theme of Daphne, the nymph who is relentlessly pursued by the god Apollo in Greek mythology and eventually begs to be turned into a tree rather than have to succumb to him. Mm -hmm. And I feel as though there is a similar sense of being trapped in this book. Anyway, I'm going to give a brief summary of Anna's practice. Anna did her BA in fine art in Jerusalem and completed her MFA at Goldsmiths in 2020. She's taken part in numerous exhibitions, including a solo show at ADA Gallery in Rome and participated in Arco Madrid in 2021 with the Ryder Gallery and in the White Cube's online show Tomorrow London in 2020. She's also received the Ingram Prize and the Gilbert Baez Award, as well as being shortlisted for the Mother Art Prize in 2019. Most recently, she had a wonderful joint show, As She Laughs, with Anusha Payne at Cook Latham Gallery, playing with the idea of the exquisite corpse. Working with a carpet making technique using a tufting gun, Anna reclaims this traditionally feminine craft and elevates it to a fine art. Equally, there's a thematic reclaiming underway in her exploration of female archetypes. In her sculptures and the performances she orchestrates with them, Anna confronts gender stereotypes, questioning roles and activities traditionally assigned to women. An amazing work was Anna's degree show installation at Goldsmiths titled Seven Wives, around the tale of King Bluebeard, who murders his wives and locks them in a room. Anna's work consisted of seven brightly colored tufted heads hanging from a line on what looked like meat hooks, with three performers embodying the heads and jerkily enacting the story, their movements becoming more jerky and jagged as the tension builds. Anna, I wanted to ask, have women always been at the centre of your practice? Not always consciously, I think, but yeah, definitely. I think the idea of craft and storytelling and taking inspiration from Slavic folklore and the female characters within it was always kind of present from very early days. I think it took me a while to understand what is it that I want to achieve by thinking or rethinking those characters. In some ways, my mom is a really big inspiration for my work as well. The transformation that she often goes, I grew up watching my mom get dressed as a ritual on a daily basis almost. So she's a bit like a drag queen. You know, my mom, Mm -hmm. she goes from this like domestic, normal person to this glamorous person when she walks out so this idea of becoming another and is it for others to appreciate it is it for her self identity that that was something it still is something that I find extremely fascinating this kind of idea of inventing yourself through makeup through clothing yeah I have the same memory actually and I also used to dress up in my mum's clothes and put on her makeup and wear her earrings and try and transform myself Yeah, my kid now wears my own dresses as well. He's six years old. So I I think it's those sort of models because you're so young, you just take it in. 
that's how you understand the world. I think the idea of the potential to change and transform and also hide certain parts of yourself or expose others and how you curate identity and how you also remove it is something that I kind of was exposed to from a young age. And it's intriguing to me. It feels as though your investigation into female archetypes in folklore and myth and so on, and how they permeate contemporary cultural narratives feels especially resonant right Mm. now. In a lot of ways, we're going through this transitional time. And I think in terms of Western culture, at least, we're kind of transitioning from a time that is very much kind of going back to the book, that is very much that character of the physician, so to speak. The age of rationality and enlightenment and this idea of a male who knows what's right and wrong. And there is only right and wrong. You know, there is this kind of world of black and white that is always in some sort of progression forward. All those systems are in the process of changing. They're breaking And I think we're in transition to a time where things will be much more fluid, fluid in all senses, in terms of gender, in terms of how we understand ourselves, in terms of accepting this division between rationality and emotionality or the mind and the body will become something different, hopefully. And I kind of understand that way of thinking as very much a female way of thinking. I'm wondering if some of this is reflected in your recent exhibition, The Moon Prophecy, at the, I don't know how you say it, Herzliya Museum of Contemporary Art in Israel. Yeah, last no, year. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, because, so the show, I'll just explain a little bit about it. The show centered on three tufted characters. The first, Dorothea, represents a magical firebird that emerges from the wall, but never breaks free from it. The second is Rusalka, a mermaid or water sprite from Slavic mythology who crouches on all fours. And the final one is Luna, who has attained upright status and is unbound to the floor or the wall. So I'm wondering if that ties in with what you're saying about this sort of sense of evolution of woman and woman's struggle for independence or self-realization. Yeah, I think... The final character in that show, Luna, the one that you said is kind of, she's upright, she's not attached to the wall, she has most agency. She also has uh, two heads, one on top of the other. And uh-huh. I think there is a sense of duality that is recurring within my work, and it has to do with this shifting. It's always between two states, rather than having a straight, clear line, if that makes sense. Yeah, so definitely in that show, it was kind of trying to think about some of those ideas as well. The Moon Prophecy, the title comes from a passage in the Bible where it's described how if the moon becomes red and it comes back a number of times, that would be the symbol of the end of the world. Mm -hmm. So within that show, I tried to imagine a kind of future cosmology where there is this release from the wall, from the attachment. And it's a world that is dominated by this duality and by this constant potential for change. Because within the performance in the show, the character woke up gradually. And also within my work, the work, it's installation and performance. I try to keep within the installation the same sort of tension the performance has. And for them to, to look as though they might become alive at any moment. So within the performances, it's a similar thing. You still have that duality. Is that a sculpture? Is that something that could become alive? It was funny, in one of the performances in Israel, somebody entered quite late to the performance and he was guided by somebody and he actually stood on the performer's hand. And then you heard people going like, oh, no. Oh, my God. (laughs) But he just didn't realize. But I think that sort of feeling of fluidity and things not being one, thing there are multiple things at the same time merging yeah. merging and this merging separating that, yeah i think that's kind of an idea that was very explored within that show there is other threads that go there too you know like thinking about evolution of the release as you really nicely described that from the female being attached to the domestic space to the wall to where carpets are often placed or at least in slavic culture And then being on all fours, almost like a baby crawling to having that presence. I think in a way, it's also about the tradition of craft. This craft was always this sort of little thing that bourgeoisie women did to keep them away from the sun. And so they won't get too bored and crazy, basically. 
like god forbid they become emotional <laughs> so it's like you know an embroider go wild <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like uh, it's out of control i want the sculptures to really like take over the space they're overpowering yeah they are i want to also ask you how you came to the technique of tufting so I was always interested in sort of exploring my domestic space or the house where I grew up because I always thought of it as I had the hunch that it's sort of an extension of one's identity. I remember friends I had in Israel commenting on how different it looks to their houses. Mm -hmm. It is very different. Where I grew up, it's a southern city. It's very hot. So most houses, they try to keep it cool within. So the colors would be lighter. Well, because my parents come from the Soviet Union, they brought their culture. So we had carpets, we had wallpaper, we had all those things that feel so out of place within where we lived. So for me, this transition between being in the house and outside the house was a constant kind of cultural transition. Also, I speak Russian to my parents. So there was a language kind of transition as well to speak in Hebrew outside. I think initially I really was always exploring the different elements within the house. I worked a bit with ceramics, like my parents have lots of porcelains. And I started doing embroidery at some point. And when we came to the UK and I was pregnant, you know, I couldn't physically do like large sculptures. So mm -hmm. I started doing lots of embroideries. And when I started Goldsmiths later, my MFA, I found out about tufting. Now it's becoming a bit more well-known and you have more and more people kind of using it as a hobby. But when I started, there was only Carolina Shanter, who's an amazing artist, but that was her and that's all I knew really. Anyway, yeah, I found out about that and I just thought it's a similar thing to embroidery. You mm -hmm. make little stitches and you basically push the yarn through a net, but on a much larger scale, really. Mm -hmm. And it's much less delicate, which allows you to morph it in different ways. So initially I did two-dimensional work, like wall-based work. But yeah, I come from sculpture and installation. And I was also interested in, as I said about my mom, and thinking about how you can recreate yourself through this external layers, looking at different rituals. And it just sort of made sense for me to start working with masks. And then those masks grew into large sculptures that cover most of the body. How has coming to Britain affected your practice? Oh, yeah, I think it really uh, gave me a sense of freedom, mm -hmm. actually, because I think Israel has a large population of immigrants coming from the ex-Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and they carry all sorts of, uh, especially women, they carry all sorts of stigmas and weights on them. And I look very Eastern European, so there is no way I can sort of escape those judgments. And I experience them quite a lot. And also, there are all sorts of hierarchies within Israel, different from the ones in the UK. <laughs> you know, you always want to belong. I, you never do. Like on that subject, I had some friends yesterday that are from Israel, and they were born there. And they were speaking about Israel as the sense of home for them. For me, that whole sense of having a home is very confusing. Mm -hmm. I don't have that sense of attachment to anything. Even when we went to Ukraine a few years ago with the family, like I remember feeling physically amazing, something about my skin, my hair. And so you fit in somehow. But, you know, I obviously don't fit in there as well. I never lived there really since I was a really young child. I know nothing about that place, really. Oh, yeah. People now, because of the situation there, they often ask me, how do I feel about it? And I really appreciate the effort. I know it comes from the best sort of place, but I haven't really lived there. I think not having a home in Israel is more painful than not having a home here. Because this is like the second time around. It's almost like you're being treated slightly like an exotic thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For me, there was a sense of release and that sense of release allowed me in terms of my practice. It just gave me a space. You know, a lot of artists actually say that, that they could touch on certain subjects only when they were away. Yes. So you need like that distance. What, for example, would be some of those subjects? Kind of thinking about identity more or about how painful and complex it is to be homeless. You know, as with the book, it's not just an external experience. I'm very jealous of people who have a really strong idea of belonging. Yeah. I think also, though, what you said about feeling liberation is understandable. It hasn't been like a, a smooth sailing. 
It was a struggle in the beginning. We lived for the first year in Canterbury as well. And that's much more conservative. Mm -hmm. So you experience yourself as very foreign. I think London is amazing in that sense. Yeah, we are in a bit of a bubble in London. I agree with you. I mean, not to the same extent, but my mum is American. My dad is British. So I don't really fit completely in America or 100% in Britain sometimes. You know, I grew up at school with Jewish jokes because my mum is Jewish. And I remember kind of laughing along and trying to pretend because I wasn't mature enough to be proud of that. You know, I just was trying to assimilate. So I think, of course, there are all sorts of prejudices in British and in any society. But I do think the good thing about London is the incredible mix of cultures and backgrounds and nationality. Definitely. Well, that leads me to my last question, actually, which is where you would like to see your practice develop. I really, really like Russian avant-garde theatre. So in my kind of wildest dreams... I imagine myself having this group of people and I started already working with the same people for a number of years, but even more, you know, like having the same performers, having my crew of people and create this kind of theatrical productions. That sounds brilliant. So each year building up a little bit closer towards something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I never believe I would be where I am at the moment. Who knows? Maybe I'll reach that goal as well. I don't see why you won't. There are so many possibilities with the works that you do and the performances. Are you already looking at working with different materials? Yeah, I started working with metal chains and that's something I'm going to explore more. And then there is the wooden structures within the sculpture. So they will become more prominent within the work as well. That's hidden, more exposed. You know, I want to expand on what they can offer to the work. Mm -hmm. And there is the the things that kind of, they're not new necessarily, but they change from a project to a project. The work with sound and the movement direction within the performance. But yeah, in terms of materials, it definitely has to do with wood and metal. And I really want to work with glass as well. That's a fantasy of mine, but it's a thing you have to learn. It's not like something you just lift and do. So yeah, we'll get there. Exciting, exciting plans. Well, thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate your taking the time and thank you for this fantastic conversation. It was thank so you. fascinating. It was really, really great. Hello, I'm artist Gillian Knipe who created this podcast and here's a little note to say a big thank you to our listeners and to guest artist Anna Parach and to author, critic and today's host, Elizabeth Fullerton. You can find Anna's work on her website, annaparach.com, and her Instagram, Anna Space Parach. The podcast notes will let you know where you can see her work right now and coming up at the time of publishing. The music for this independently produced and abridged podcast was written and performed by Griffin Knipe, while award-winning animator Joanna Quinn of Beryl Productions created the Art Fiction's logo. Please subscribe and rate, which helps other people find the podcast. And check out Art Fiction's podcast on Instagram for images of artists, guests and their work. Happy reading and art viewing. Till next time.